All right. Uh, hello, everyone. We're going to give a minute or two for uh, people to jump in. It's going to take a little bit. Uh, obviously, we've got tons of people that are going to be here for the webinar tonight. So uh, just bear with us as we take a minute to let people go ahead and enter in. Uh, for those of you that are joining right now for uh, this global exit in the Americas webinar, uh, I want to invite you to uh, take full use of the chat down at the bottom. <clears throat> Excuse me, chat with your fellow attendees. Uh, additionally, uh, we are going to have time for uh, Q&A. Uh, and all questions uh, need to be submitted by utilizing the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you'll see it down here. Um, you'll find it. I have faith in you. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Daniel Miller. I'm president of the Texas Nationalist Movement and uh, very glad and uh, proud to be hosting this inaugural topic on this webinar series over global exit and the Americas. Uh, and very excited to uh, to see this topic being the topic that we're kicking off with. Uh, obviously, it's one not only near and dear to the heart of our organization, but uh, really near and dear to my heart as well. And so uh, I'm excited that tonight we're going to uh, have the opportunity to introduce uh, some of the folks that we know that are not in Texas, but are really movers and shakers in the global exit movement uh, those surrender centered around uh, the Americas. Uh, that being said, we're going to have a phenomenal panel tonight. Uh, we have got a few guests that are having technical issues in connecting, and hopefully they'll be able to join us later. Uh, but uh, until then, uh, just we're going to we're going to roll with who we have, and are very excited that uh, even they could join us. So uh, one last bit of business before I introduce our speakers for tonight. Uh, again, if you are just now joining us as people are trickling into this webinar, uh, feel free to take full use of the chat to chat with your fellow attendees. Additionally, uh, if you do have questions tonight, please utilize the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and uh, if you have your, if your question is directed specifically at one of the panelists, uh, then please indicate so. Otherwise, it will be treated as a jump ball, okay? And we'll just throw it out there and make it work however we can. All right, uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, two of our panelists tonight. Uh, guys, if you'd like to go ahead and fire up your cameras. Uh, from uh, the Cal Exit Movement, the president of Yes California, we have Marcus Ruiz Evans, uh, Marcus founded the Cal Exit Movement uh, with his book, California's Next Century 2.0, uh, that it was released in, in 2012. And it was the first book to talk seriously about California becoming a nation. Uh, since then, I've gotten to know uh, Marcus. We've been on uh, more than one panel together. Uh, and that includes an occasional drive-by by yours truly on their regular uh, webcast yeah. that they do. Uh, which is a, a lot of fun. So um, this is uh, Marcus Ruiz Evans, and I'd like to introduce uh, one of our guests from, uh, uh, oddly enough, someone who uh, really surprised everyone that there was a, an active <clears throat> independence movement in the northern Mexican states. And so uh, Carlos uh, Eduardo Sanchez is the uh, one of the leaders of the Arito America Project movement. Uh, and Carlos, if you'd like to turn your camera on, you can go ahead and do that. We'd like everybody to see your smiling face. There we go. There. I asked him to start his video, Marcus. There we go. There's Carlos. Carlos hey, Eduardo hey. Sanchez. And so uh, Carlos, he was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, in Delicias, and he graduated from New Mexico State University uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering. And in 2016, uh, he joined a rising and burgeoning movement uh, there in the nine northern Mexican states to secure their own independence uh, from the central government there in Mexico. So with our first two panelists, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Everyone, please, in chat, give them a very warm welcome. Uh, and I'd like to begin by uh, asking Marcus, just kind of explain what's happening with Cal Exit, uh, how that movement came about, and, and how things are going for you guys right now. Uh, it's, it's going pretty good. So we are really excited about midterms. Most Californians are terrified of midterms for the same reason that the Cal Exit movement is excited for midterms. Californians are afraid that 
evil, dastardly, bad American Republicans are going to take over in midterms. And as you saw with Joseph Biden, um, he basically inculcated what we had long held. In the California mind, there is no difference between the Republican Party and Donald Trump. Every single Republican, all 74 million of you are hardcore white supremacist Donald Trump fans. That's what Joe Biden said. And out here, California people are buying it. And I don't personally agree with that. You know that, Daniel. I'm giving you the perspective from California. We have our own relationship, but I have to be aware of my people. Uh, what that means is that if midterms go to conservatives, Californians are going to view it as a loss to Donald Trump again. It won't just, even though he's not running, they'll view it as this is Donald Trump's party and Trump came back and you said that he would be gone forever and now he's back, which means we can never get rid of him. Therefore, we must secede. So we're expecting a gigantic amount of support for Calexit right after midterms and right after Republicans win. Looking forward to it. Well, there we go. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, over to you, Carlos. Uh, you know, a lot of people are quite unfamiliar with the, the fact that you guys are working on independence. Uh, why don't you uh, just kind of give everyone a, a short background about, about yourself, about the movement, and, and some of the, the motivations and underlying um, arguments that, that are moving you guys toward independence? Uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, first of all. And I was uh, uh, in a graduate school in uh, Europe a few years ago, and uh, uh, I was in the middle of the immigration crisis in Germany. And I, I saw a lot of uh, of uh, people from the from Syria going through going through Austria and through the trains in in Munich and, and Germany and through through all the, the the whole country all the way to uh, uh, the Netherlands and Sweden. And uh, as, as I was studying and, and working in both countries, in the Netherlands and in Germany, uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, a lot of this. And uh, there was a, a, a huge movement of uh, right-wing nationalism uh, that, that was going on in, in Europe. Uh, and a lot of, of course, uh, support for the immigration effort uh, to, to support people. And uh, I was just in the middle of that and uh, on, on social media in uh, Mexico, uh, there were some, some news, uh, let's say of, of some comments about uh, what would, uh, uh, what about the North uh, in Mexico? What about the North? We, we call it, of course, as the Spanish name, El Norte, but uh, it, is, it is the North. For us, the North is just the nine, the, the, the seven or the nine country, uh, uh, states in, in Mexico. And uh, maybe for some people, the North is also the United States, but uh, we, we started thinking about what would happen to, to, the, to the North uh, as Mexico was coming through the, um, to this new government that we now have, which we believe is, uh, is, has a socialist communist leaning. And, uh, we, uh, well, a lot of people in social media started to uh, raise those questions about what about our states? What about our identity? What about, uh, and, and, of, and of course, our present and our future for the years to come. So uh, I joined uh, a, a social media based group in, in, uh, in Facebook uh, when it was in Europe. And then I, 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 came, I came back to, to Mexico in 2016. And then I, I started uh, talking to, to different people. And I was uh, just uh, looking at the whole, uh, all of the main capitals of the nine states. Uh, there were many people who had the same comments and uh, that wanted to, to, uh, to see uh, what would be, what would be like to have a government as, uh, as now we have in, under Lopez Obrador. So, this uh, the movement was uh, already created, but was loosely created, and then we started to a little bit join more more people, and we name it our, our uh, Arido American Project movement. And Arido America is a long, is a long name, but it's basically a join with is is a two words between Arido and then America, and we believe that we are the. Uh, Aridos or the Norteños from the Americas or from, from the continent. 
and we just called the name because uh, uh, we we thought it would be original, it would be uh, good. It would uh, present with some some sort of uh, um, uh, some sort of sense of what we what we wanted. Uh, of course, we also use Norte, just El Norte, uh, to refer to the to the states. And uh, and since we share a lot of history and a lot of I guess identity with the south the southwest in the United States, so we. We also think we, we we share a lot of values and a lot of things in common with Texas and New Mexico and uh, the former uh, states, uh, Mexican states in the 19th century. So uh, it is basically uh, a, a project in which we want to uh, mobilize the peoples of the nine northern states of Mexico to think about their identity in a, in a new way, basically. We believe the people of the northern states uh, constitute a nation in itself with similar identity, similar values, similar culture, which live in a, in a political uh, entity called Mexico that we now call Mexico. So um, that's basically uh, what, we, what we are. Super, hey Carlos, thank you very much. And uh, skirting in here, uh, someone whose tardy slip will be available at the principal's office later. Uh, <laughs> it's our good friend and colleague, uh, Alu Axelman. Uh, and uh, for those of you who do not uh, know Alu, many of you know he has been a friend of the TNM for quite some time and, and very vocal. He claims to be the hardest working guy in the secession business. Uh, but, um, you know, that's, that's kind of like West Side Story fighting words on this webinar. So just keep that to yourself, buddy. Uh, but let me, let me introduce uh, Alu Axelman. He's the chairman of the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence. Uh, in his personal life, he is a prolific author and a paramedic. Uh, I don't know when he sleeps, uh, but I know he uh, probably only when he works himself into a near coma. Uh, but uh, so, Alu, thank you so much for joining us. And, and I'll give you the opportunity that I gave um, Marcus and, and Carlos. Uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and particularly about the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence and some of the efforts that you're uh, that you guys are doing there in New Hampshire. Sure. Thanks for having me. And hello to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be with you. Um, Alu Axelman of Foundation for New Hampshire Independence, and I run LibertyBlock.com. It's a pro-liberty publication and podcast based in New Hampshire. I'm a voluntarist and pro-independence advocate. Um, I'm also the president and chairman of the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence and NationIndependence.org. We're a nonprofit that promotes the benefits of independence for New Hampshire and the New Hampshire independence movement. I don't know what you guys have gone over so far. Sorry, I'm late. I'm juggling a billion things. Um, I, I had a meeting around long and I actually forgot. So, so thanks. I'm glad Daniel texted me. Um, I don't know if you mentioned or not, the New Hampshire independence movement is just, it's amazing. We have so much momentum. Every day we're getting more and more things, uh, more successes. We had a legislation sponsored by nine state reps, including some in leadership a year ago um, or a few months ago this session. And it didn't pass, obviously, but but it had you know a lot of interesting debate for the first time. We debated in the House of Representatives in New Hampshire, independence for a few hour long committee hearing, and they debated it some more on the House floor before the vote. So it was a phenomenal time. And a few weeks ago, someone started a New Hampshire independence pack. I think it's nhipac.org, and they've already endorsed 15, 20 candidates. I think around half or most of them won their primaries. Um, so we're just doing fantastic. Uh, there's so much to be excited about, and we have so many people in the movement in New Hampshire that are doing their own thing. Again, as some of you know, we're already decentralized. It's hard to uh, to shepherd a bunch of you know crazy wild hogs. You know, it's not like sheep. It's very hard to to shepherd them. Um, so even if you tell them what to do, they're not going to listen. Even if they're friends, we cooperate, but we don't like centrally organize. So some people have made things like the GraniteRepublic.com, which is pretty much already just assuming that New Hampshire is a country and, and they put out our own flags. This guy designed a flag for New Hampshire um, and they sell tons of beautiful hats and shirts, really, really beautiful um, with, with a flag that actually makes sense. It's nicer than our current flag for New Hampshire. Um, so he's promoting independence as far as state patriotism. Uh, we have other people doing legislative stuff, other people working on cultural stuff, uh, so many different things that we're, we're working on in New Hampshire. So I'm super excited. And again, it's great to be in this movement the TNM just loaded on my other screen. So I see the beautiful TNM site now. Nice. I don't know where that came from. It just popped up. Um, so it's it's so nice to be with, with again, incredible people like CalEx at TNM and so many others. And Carlos, I have not met you yet. So I, I 
would love an introduction to Carlos, I suppose. Well, if you'd have just been here a little bit earlier, you would have gotten it. No, well, <laughs> we'll, we'll get, we'll oh, get to it. Don't I'm hit Carlos. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm, I'm with Marcus. Let's break out here. That sound, that's the world's smallest violin. I'm no. trying my best. No. We'll, we'll, connect, right. we'll connect you guys up. We'll make sure that you guys get connected up. And, of course, look, our thoughts go out to uh, to Nick Navarez, who is not here. As you guys know, he was uh, he's one of the most vocal advocates for Puerto Rican independence. Uh, they just recently got hit by a hurricane. Their entire grid on the island was down. Uh, but Nick happened to be in Miami at the time. Uh, and now they're being targeted with a hurricane. So, um, you know, they're, they're, I think they're looking at a Florida landfall for this next hurricane. So, uh, Nick is spending his time, I believe, running away from weather. Uh, so, uh, you know, look, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to Nick and, and the, the folks there in Puerto Rico and, of course, Florida. They're getting ready to get hit. I am quite sympathetic uh, living down here in Hurricane Alley myself. So, um, you know, let's let's think about Nick. Maybe he'll get an opportunity to join us, but let's don't hold his feet to the fire. Uh, additionally, um, we uh, sent out invitations to a few other in, uh, independence movements in the Western Hemisphere uh, that were not able to make the scheduling, uh, including representatives from Alberta and Canada and uh, the MSPI down in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So, uh, we're, we're going to have, I think by the time it's all over with a, a pretty massive global exit summit featuring, uh, players from all over the Western hemisphere. So, uh, there'll be plenty of network time. Well, uh, gentlemen, before I get to, um, some of the questions, uh, let me remind everyone that are just now joining us. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, submit them using the Q and a button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, submit your questions if you want to direct it specifically to one of the folks here about Global Exit uh, or about their particular independence movement, please do that. And, and I must say, while I appreciate all of these Texit questions, I'm not going to be answering them because you get me live every Wednesday night on my live stream and you can pepper me all you want to there. But while we have these fine folks here, uh, please, uh, we're only going to take questions for them. So let's, uh, guys, let's, let me uh, just throw this out there a, as a jump ball, uh, because I think it, it's important. Why do you think, uh, and, and you guys just kind of take it and we'll banner this thing back and forth. Why do you think it is that people over here in the Americas are just so shocked that there are independence movements over here when, you know, exit has been the, tr the global trend for the last 75 to 80 years? Uh, Carlos, do you want to go first? Fine, thank you. I believe uh, the, the current state of affairs in the world is, uh, it's, uh, has, has, has changed a lot, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, after the, um, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, as, as you know, the, I guess America defeated, or, or the American way of life defeated the, uh, defeated the uh, fascism and communism. And, uh, and and they came out uh, as, as winners. So uh, we had only one way, and, and and it was that way. So I believe uh, a lot of what's going on in the war, those new nationalist movement, or those um, uh, right wing movement or or, or left wing movements, are uh, as a response to to that phenomenon that that occurred after the fall of the Soviet Union and and the, and the end of the of the new of the of the Cold War. As you know, we have a, a little bit sort of kind of a new Cold War with China and, and I guess with uh, uh, Russia. And, and, and you know, the war is, is being divided into blocks or, or, or uh, uh, let's say regions, uh, which are pretty much more uh, uh, independent or they want to be more independent uh, to, to what they do with their economic system, their political system. So all of these movements, I believe, are, are reactions, just, just reactions one way or, or the other uh, to, to what's going on to the current state of affairs. Gentlemen, care to chime in? The How question is, go? why are people what? surprised? Yeah, why, why, why are they so shocked when they hear that people like us exist? I think... Most people, including me until a few years ago, most people learned um, that the song about Indivisible for All is a song and a pledge and it's the word of God and it's canon and it's set in stone. And people think, and you know, even me, when I was younger, 
I thought that the Pledge of Allegiance was something very legitimate, like the Declaration and the Constitution. I didn't realize it was just a pledge written by, you know, some crazy crooked socialist from Massachusetts, like, you know, 100 years later. But, you know, you kind of think all those three things, the Pledge, Declaration, and Constitution are all, they are canon to, you know, American politics. So, so you know, there's that. Everyone says indivisible, indivisible. It just came from there, I believe. Um, people say it's a perpetual union, and, and the more educated ones say the Articles of Confederation said a more perpetual union or, or a, a perpetual uh, whatever perfect union forever. Um, but again, that obviously the answer to that is the Articles of Confederation were scrapped. If they still existed, the federal government wouldn't have power. So I would trade the word perpetual maybe or indivisible for the federal government not being able to collect any taxes or non-existing. You know, but but again, they take they want the best of both worlds for from their perspective. Um, yeah, I, I think. A lot of people think that we ha we are one country. Again, I and many others didn't know. I, I think I do this because of a different situation. But most people think that a uh, country, that United States is one country, the USA is one country, and they don't know that state throughout the world and all of history was a synonym with country. I I happen to know this because I knew about the state of Israel when I was being raised. I moved when I was four to the state of Israel. So I knew that state always meant Israel. And in Hebrew, it's Medinat Israel, which means the state of Israel, literally. Medina means state and country. It's a synonym. So I knew that every state, and it's just it's just language, but it's important because every state is a synonym with country. Every state is its own country and was. Texas was the Republic of Texas. So it was a country before they joined the Union. Now, now the one beef I have with Texas is apparently, from my understanding, they were really asking a lot of them to be begging, to be annexed by the United States um, because weird situations with Mexico and war and other stuff. But I'm like, those darn people 100 years ago, whatever, 150 years ago, why were they begging the United States to annex them? Um, you know, so that was interesting. But but they were all individual countries. They were all independent countries, pretty much. Um, and then the United States started going west and west and west and, and you know, developing and buying land and stuff. Um, New Hampshire was a colony. We seceded. And for 13 years, between like 76 and 89, in 1789, we were an independent country. And I've heard rumors that apparently our governor, the same position was called president in our constitution. And it was amended after 1789 to call it a governor. So we were a fully functioning state, meaning a nation state. So that's another thing, the history, a lot of people don't really understand because they weren't taught. Yeah. And Marcus, you know, you and I have actually talked about this before. And I know, uh, you know, a lot of our folks that are on here tonight have heard me say it, but uh, you and I had a pretty in-depth conversation about this, that Probably one of the things that that has hurt the concept of self-determination over here in, in the Americas, uh, particularly the United States, more than anything else, has been the conflation of the word state, nation, and country. Yeah, uh, I just want to say I agree with you, Daniel, and I agree with um, Elliot. I believe that we've all been educated culturally to believe that you can't secede, period, end of story. It's illegal, and if you were to even talk about it or look at it, you must be a horrible, nasty, wicked person. Uh, I was never taught that Texas versus white exists. I was never taught there was a Supreme Court decision that says you could legally secede. I had no idea that that existed for 120 years until I started looking into it. Additionally, the other thing they don't teach is the Treaty of Paris, You'll routinely hear Americans talk on and on about the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. That's great. They have absolutely nothing to do with the formation of America. The Treaty of Paris is the document that actually makes America a country because you don't get to be a country unless a recognized country recognizes you. That's why France and England recognized America in the Treaty of Paris. So um, no, I'm not from Impractical Jokers, but I do see the resemblance. Anyways. The Treaty of Paris refers to all of the 13 colonies as separate capital S states, nations. So when you look at the document that actually made America legally a country, it refers to 13 separate sovereign countries. You will never hear anyone in America talking about how secession's bad ever mention the Treaty of Paris. You'll also never hear them mention Texas versus white. I, let, me, let me get a few more points out and then I'll... And to me, what that does is prove willful ignorance. We don't want our people to know the truth. That's why these gigantic factoids that I was shocked to learn about aren't ever taught to our kids. Just like here in California. In California, they don't teach us 
and it's nowhere in the public schools to be found that California was independent from Mexico and California for as long as Texas was. Now in Texas, you guys are educated about that, right? Your school children get to know that. Our school children don't get to know that. So when we make sure that our school children are not informed of facts and we make sure that our professors never bring this up and we make sure our news media never mentions these factoids, it's easy to create a narrative that uh, this is a horrible, bad idea. It's illegal and nobody's interested in it. Secondly, they never let us on TV, right? I remember with Cal Exit, they would interview professors going, this is stupid and nobody backs it, but they'd never interview anyone in the movement. And then they just show that on TV going, see, everybody thinks this is stupid. So I think there is a willful, intentional ignorance by whatever you want to call it, the government, media, deep state, whatever, to make sure that people don't know the facts. And that's built on top of what Elliot said, where there's a culture of America's permanent and it's always together. That's based upon a song that was written after America was formed and it is not based upon the law. And yet if you talk to people, they go, it's indivisible. Well, how do you know it? The, the song, that's not a legal reference. That's not a legal reference. So yeah. we're really ignorant and I'll, and I'll leave it with this that, um, I'm sorry, two more points real quick. Zygbiev Brzezinski. Zygbiev Brzezinski was the national security advisor to three American presidents during the Cold War. After the Cold War, when he was in Germany, he said, Americans are so dumb about the foreign world and have no interest in knowing about it. It made it so easy for us at the federal level to do whatever foreign adventure that we want. That was the guy who advised three presidents. He says, Americans are willful, willfully ignorant of the foreign world, and they like that. If we look at the foreign world, Scotland, Catalonia, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Donbass, uh, New Caledonia, there's countries all over the world pursuing referendums, but you wouldn't know it if you're in America. So ignorance and willful ignorance on top of willful ignorance and a doubling down to stay ignorant uh, and keep ourselves ignorant is why. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's like what we tell people all the time, you know, that explosion of nation states after World War II, uh, those, those countries didn't fall from space and the earth didn't get any bigger. You know, there were people just like us that believed that the best people to govern us just happened to be us, right? Well, uh, you guys, uh, we're getting some questions in from uh, some of the folks. And if you haven't had a chance to answer your uh, ask your question yet uh, and are just now joining us, be sure to hit the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen uh, and drop your question in there, and we will get that uh, in the queue as best we can. Uh, this question is uh, from George, uh, and it's directed to Carlos. Um, uh, George wants to know, how could the nine northern Mexican states' independence help eradicate the menace of the uh, trafficking cartels, as well as any influence coming from the communist Chinese? Yeah, I was looking at that question. Uh, well, um, I guess there, there are two ways, or the solution would be, would, would, would be uh, uh, created out of two, two ways. One is uh, uh, economic uh, way. And I believe, uh, I think that the, um, what the Chinese uh, communist regime is, is now proposing is to, of course, uh, have more control over the, the economic system in the world, manufacturing facilities, and on, on four, they get to, to get to the to that number, to, to, the, to the first position in, 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 in global, global power and, and, and dominance and influence. And, uh, but I think this is a, a, a huge challenge for the, for the United States. It's gonna be a huge, a huge challenge for, for the United States or for, or for Texas or for, or for California, because uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of businesses are, 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 are a lot of capital is, is going to, to China to be invested there. And, and I think it's uh, now with what's going on with Taiwan and what's going on with, uh, uh, Russia and what's going with Asia as, as a whole continent. I think the United States and, and, and Texas or California are, will have to look for other places to, to invest. So I think that uh, in, in, this, in this specific question, um, uh, having a, a close relationship with the nine states or the, the nine northern states uh, of Mexico in which American businesses, American businessmen in, in, invest in, in, this, in this region 
to, uh, to, to continue uh, growing the manufacturing sectors the manufacturing hubs that are already, already here, uh, I think they can uh, connect and they can uh, grow the, the, the supply chains in order to, to, to have more or a, a close uh, uh, trade relationship so that we could uh, manufacture those goods and then export them to, to, uh, to America or to Texas or to California to make, uh, uh, to, to make those businesses more competitive. And with that revenue, with that increased revenue, if you bring the capital from China to the, to, to the North and then we start doing business and then we, we start collecting taxes in our own, and then uh, we could pay for security. We could, we could pay for, for, a, for, for a better uh, security uh, uh, with police, intelligence, that we can cooperate to, to seal the, the border. I mean, to, to change the border completely. So that the, in the way that hasn't been seen uh, before, uh, I mean, with uh, the, I mean, America has a lot of technology, a lot of uh, intelligence uh, uh, strategies, uh, drones, a lot of uh, ways in which uh, the border could be could be sealed or could be uh, closed, almost closed. Uh, maybe maybe with a wall, maybe not with a wall. I mean, I don't really care about it, but it is really important that because it's, it's, it's something that we're res we think that we're responsible for. No, not you. I mean, you don't have to, to solve the issue. The issue it has to be solved by us. So with that revenue, we could pay for that increased uh, security on the border so that we can have a, a, a safer environment and in and, 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 and safer community in both, in both countries, I mean, Texas and, and the North. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Marcus, uh, we're getting a, we're getting a lot of Calexit questions. Hey, I know you're excited about that. I love uh, it. So this is also from George. George wants to know, uh, just a, it's a fundamental question about Calexit. Uh, does Calexit work toward the secession of the entire state or just certain uh, counties slash regions of all of California? Now yeah. there's the Jefferson movement, but, uh, we don't, we don't really work with them, mostly because they don't want to work with us. We've reached out to them three times. They view us as monsters, so they don't want to have anything to do with us. Technically, when we're looking at secession, uh, there really is no legal precedent for letting individual counties leave. Counties exist because the state said they do. States exist because the Constitution recognizes. There's no federal recognition of counties, so there might not be a real mechanism for that. Well, okay. well, I think to clarify, th there's a lot of great work that I'm sure you guys all know about redstatesecession.com. Um, the person who runs that has done a lot of work. And to clarify, Marcus, you're right that, that that there's no real precedent and it's very difficult because it has to involve Congress's approval to have various counties from different states uh, separate and form a new state of the state of Jefferson. Um, however, as Red State Secession points out in many articles that we have republished with his permission on libertyblock.com, um, counties have moved from one state to another, especially a border county can move from this state to that state. Um, and that takes very little, does not require Congress to approve it, I don't think. Um, and it's happened many times, including a few decades ago, it happened most recently, I believe. So as long as they don't want us to create a new 51st state, because then they have to be admitted into the union, then there's that whole question, and Congress has to approve it. Also, if I were going to start another state, I wouldn't want to be in the union. So on second thought, if Jefferson, if the state of Jefferson, um, again, and it, which makes more sense because they're all pretty liberty conservative as opposed to Cal Exit. And I think their question has some merit in that Cal Exit, we understand it, but not every single person in California is progressive. So there would still be some big disagreements. And then from there, you might have to figure out some solutions and or split further after independence. So I think that's a valid question. So we, yeah, just we a few don't think so. About that. Yeah, I, I hear you, but, but we don't view it that way. So we view it as California will leave together. California is, uh, you know, 80% of the population is liberal and likes the way things are going. I know that seems crazy to people outside of California, but uh, the the Trump-loving people are in the far north, and they're about 20% of the population. And they would move. Yeah. After independence, they would likely move back they, to the United they States. Might. Back. Yeah, but the other thing is that counties can't break off from the state unless the population of that state gives them permission. So Jefferson's going nowhere unless the people of California say it's okay. That's the law. Uh, by the way, I'll also point out that the two times they tried to split California up under Tim Draper, three states and six states, 
65 and 73 percent of Californians, according to the PPIC, said hell no. So we have two surveys in recent history where two thirds of the population said hell no. Also, I'll point out if Jefferson wants to get our votes, the worst way to do that is during the Trump era when everybody's freaking out about Trump to say you love him and then say the rest of California is stupid for not backing him. I, I would think insulting the people you want to get votes from and saying that they're dumb and idiots uh, when they feel that they're having an existential crisis is the total opposite way of what would be called successful politicking. Well, and uh, interestingly enough, I think that actually gets down to uh, one of the other questions that was submitted. Um, and it is, and it is not there anymore. Because I think uh, I think Alu answered it by typing. If you click the answer tab, you can see all the questions. It's okay. I got oh, you. It's a quick, yeah, it's no, it's no worries. This question was from Regina, and it's a bit of a jump ball. Um, she wants to to ask everyone. Uh, this is a question of practicality. She says, uh, "What has been uh, hardest? What has been your hardest process in getting your movements going?" And I think you know we'll just jump ball this. If you guys want to. Take it round robin, uh, short answers. But what what are what has kind of been the the number one obstacle that you're facing in each of your situations? Uh, for us, it's two things. We don't get to have a fair playing field. So, like I talked about, if we get big, there will be media articles about us. They will not interview any of us and they'll interview people not in our movement who are experts who say, don't join our movement. It's not going to go anywhere. So even in America, the land of free discussion, free press, no, we don't get that. So not having free press and not having a fair discussion absolutely hurts us. The other thing is that unfair uh, play. We just had our, our second social media site hacked the moment after we got big. So you get big and people stop playing fair and they do unfair things like doxing and shutting down your site and trying to cancel you. Um, so, you know, they'll take away the tools that you have and they'll make sure that you don't even get a chance to uh, voice your opinion in supposedly free media. Those are the top two. How about you, Carlos? Well, I believe the, the number one um, issue here is that uh, any any uh, rumor or any comment about uh, other ways to think about your identity uh, already identifies you as a racist, as a pro-American, or as a uh, that we're selling ourselves to to the United States, or that uh, we are a, a classist, which is uh, let's say discriminating discriminating people because of their because of their southern accent in, or they live in South Mexico because they have Indian descent uh, or uh, ancestry or any, or any of that. So that's a, the, the biggest challenge that we've, we've found in the, in the, over the years. And also to get politicians in, involved. I mean, uh, there are, I've, I've had communications with some uh, uh, governors or, or senators but they, they, they like it, but they, they don't say much. So um, they, uh, few, well, uh, two years ago, by the beginning of the pandemic, there was uh, a, a sort of coalition of, of several, go several governors. Uh, most of them were from the North. And then uh, they were also, they were calling uh, to, to um, they were calling the federal government to, to look at the, at the, at, the, at the tax revenue law that uh, we believe is unfair. So it's one of the, our, our, our topics. And since it was their main topic, we, we thought that we, we could uh, somehow connect and then go rolling. But uh, the, somehow uh, some governors just uh, ended their term. And then the, the president, uh, of, of course, uh, quenched the, the, the whole thing. So, I mean, those are the, I, I guess, the, the, the the biggest challenges that we have down here in South Border. Gotcha. And how about you, Mr. Axelman? Is my mic still working? Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. If not, if not, you could act it out, and we would try to guess. <laughs> I'm actually literally a really bad actor. I've, I've tried. Um, <laughs> the biggest challenge for us, honestly, is 
is exposure. Um, not enough people know we exist. When I bump into random people, totally random in the store, and I say, hey, there's a vote on independence. How are you voting? Yes or no? Around 70 to 80% say yes. Um, and one, there were like two 18-year-old girls in Walmart say, hey, you, would you vote yes on independence? And I, I think they were mostly Latino, but they, uh, they understood English. Um, and they said yes before I even finished the question. And one of them, I was going to ask why. I think she also, before I mentioned any question, she said inflation. Inflation is out of hand. And that's the thing about it, about Let's Go Brandon, because people, even the 18-year-olds who drive, they feel it. They feel it at the pump. They see it. It's not $2. It's $4 a gallon. It's, it's different. They see the groceries cost more because they were in Walmart. They were shopping. So people see inflation uh, and, and everyone's affected by that. It's not like gun owners care about gun rights, but others don't. Inflation affects every single human who ever buys anything, which is almost everyone, every adult. Um, so people don't really know that much. Um, of those who know or just get the question, most of them support it already. Again, I'm I'm in the minority here. I, I do think that if we had a vote tomorrow for independence, it would be pretty darn close. I, I think it would be over that 66 threshold percentage required to uh, leave the union, to, to vote yes on a constitutional amendment. Um, the other challenges are just the misconceptions of it's illegal. The federal government could kill you. They should kill you if you do it. Um, of course, the the recent poll from Survey USA found that six percent of people throughout the union would support military action for a state that left the union. So that's that's again going nowhere. Um, other misconception is that we you know we would starve to death without DC because I'm sure you, we would all agree that the people in DC are the smartest, most amazing, capable, good, kind, brilliant people. And without them, dumb people like Daniel and uh, Marcus and Alu and Carlos would starve to death without them. We couldn't figure out, you know, how to put our pants on. So, we, once but, we, but it would take me a long time to starve. I mean, look at me. It would take me a really long time. <laughs> but eventually. I'm in for eventually. the long haul, baby. The long haul. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, uh, I've got, there's a question that's coming in for you, Alu. So let me, let me hit you with this one. This is from Clark. And Clark wants to know, how is the legislature dealing with the anti-independence people? Uh, have any been voted out of office yet? So just kind of give us sort of a rundown, a little background for people who don't know that you guys actually had legislation debated on the floor during the last session. Yes, sir. So we had legislation called CACR 32. It stands for Constitutional Amendment Concurrent Resolution. Um, ultimately, nine sponsored it. By the time it was actually... Uh, published on the site. There were only seven sponsors. Two of them fell off because I guess they were afraid or, or you know, threatened by leadership or called traitors and said they would be charged criminally or removed from office. Um, ultimately, 13 voted in favor of it. So the majority voted against it. And now the establishment of the left and the right, the Republican establishment, including Dictator Sununu, um, have been opposing it very strongly. There were actually ads done and mailers sent out. So so a group, uh, Dictator Sununu, Chris Sununu, who was former governor now called dictator, he spent um, his pack actually raised over $200,000, I believe. And they spent at least 30,000, but maybe, maybe more, maybe the full 200,000 on mailers against a few representatives, mostly who supported independence and or the ones who tried to impeach him when he became a dictator under corona fascism. So um, now one of them, because he also had a few other scandals going again from, from the authoritarians and the corrupt people in, in his local area in Belknap County. One of them lost his primary. Another one who voted yes on the bill lost his primary. Um, of the other 13, everyone else who's running for office, I believe, won their primaries. Joshua Kella voted yes on independence, and he was attacked with this ad from Dictator Sununu himself, again, also a Republican, spent a lot of money sending out mailers to his district, and I believe he still won his primary. Melissa Blasek was attacked. She won her primary. Um, so even Dictator Sununu, who kind of runs the Republican Party around here, and leadership um, uh, sent out ads and, and attacked these people, and they still won their primaries. Um, yeah, I don't think it was anyone else who who voted yes on independence who didn't win a primary. I think it was just Sylvia and and Norm Silver from um, Belknap County, and they also had you know for months prior, even for the last year or so, Sununu and and all the leftists and the Republican establishment has been coming after them really hard for the gun stock um, the, the scandal in which pretty much. By, be, by being state reps in that county, they're also automatically on the delegation, um, the kind of the commissioners who oversee the county government. So as state reps are automatically also a county commissioner, essentially. And there was a, a government owned, a state owned, county owned, big um, resort area, ski area. And it turns out there's been a lot of corruption and money from that publicly owned, you know, government owned state thing um, has been somehow going towards Dick Dennis and the news of the election campaign. So a lot of corruption. 
And I think pretty much the staff, the entire staff of Gunstock Resort area quit like a day before the audit was going to happen. So, you know, a lot of really, really interesting stuff. And then they said, oh, we all quit because uh, Mike Sylvia is a crazy state rep and he was making things impossible for us. Yeah, they're going to do an audit of the books and see that a lot of money was funneled from this government-owned public park entity to Sununu's campaign and a lot of other corruption. So they were about to do the, the uh, audit. And then to, so Sununu and his friends have been attacking Sylvia and Norm Silver and the other reps in that area for a long time. So you see the gun stack issue and the pack, the other pack that they made for that and Sununu's pack, they were able to defeat those two in the primary, but they spent hundreds of thousands. So like they've actually spent a lot of their money. So will they have $100,000 next year to... to um, attack independence people maybe not like they've used a lot of money and yes they got two out we still have 10 and we have five or 10 more coming in who are going to be new state reps probably this november who do support independence so we're doing probably even better than last year in that sense well super well uh well gentlemen we've got time for a couple of more questions um we'll we'll take one more from the audience and then uh, i've got a closing question uh for each of you so this is from jeff uh, Jeff has been very patient. He he submitted his question right out of the gate. Um, he wants to know, and this is a jump ball for all of you. He says, other than public polling, how do you measure the acceptability of the idea of national divorce as a real option in the minds of the population of your area? You guys take this jump ball and we'll run through and give everybody an opportunity to tackle this one if you'd like to. We had polling in February 2017 that showed 32% of Californians were for exit and additional 15.7% were willing to discuss it, making about 47.5 open to that. However, that poll is now five years old. So we've had to start to look at other signs. What we did was when we noticed on our social media that we had a gigantic bump, uh, then we would look at the comments and see if the comments from people on that bump matched the comments people made when they were supporting Calix in 2017. So I understand you guys may have a different opinion of it. When Roe v. Wade happened, people freaked out over here. We had three newspaper articles by three major newspapers saying, let's secede because they uh, undid Roe v. Wade. And then we looked at our social media and we had a ton of activity across social media. And we made a show about it. A lot of people on the social media were saying, Where's Yes California? Where's CalExit? Let's get CalExit going. Let's get Yes California going. And we ran those names past our membership roles, and these were all new people. So we were able to confirm that people we had never had contact with were still talking about our movement and still going, where is it? And they did it right when Roe v. Wade happened. Um, so we were able to say, see, there's still people interested. They're still saying the same thing. There are even people we haven't had contact with, which means our movement's bigger than, and it, it kind of keeps growing. We did that, people bought it. That's not exactly the same thing as a poll, but it's a pretty good um, moment in time that seemed to convince people that the market was still there, as we call it. Yep, and that, that's a good answer because he specifically wanted to know other than public polling. So uh, good answer, Marcus. Uh, what about for you guys, Carlos? Other than public polling, how what, what methods do you guys use to kind of gauge the temperature for support of the issue? Yeah. Um, there was a, 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 a poll, um, a precinct poll, that uh, <clears throat> was asked about uh, to all Mexicans if they identify as Mexicans or, or, or not or something else. And uh, the, uh, it came out as 50% or close to 50% uh, believe that they could call Mexico or not. Uh, so <laughs> that was surprising for us. But uh, we, what we do is that we um, study the actions by politicians. Uh, declarations by them, or um, let's say uh, coalitions between uh, several uh, governors from from the ninth northern states, and we we celebrate it and, and we we support it in social media. We also uh, count and measure and contact uh, uh, groups that are focused on on the uh, identity of the north or history of the north or or anything that has to do with with the north of the Norteño people. And we, uh, uh, as, as, those, as these groups uh, start growing and start developing and start to, to have more or less the same rejection to the federal centralist government that we have, we believe that uh, the message is, is going through. So um, other than polling, we, we, would, uh, we would count and we would uh, uh, see the, the, that temperature of the, those messages from from people, those general comments from people. And that's the way we 
we uh, make sure that we we are growing and in, in a sense yeah super carlos thank you and how about you alu we do have a recent poll from survey usa that found pretty good support for independence i think i mentioned that and i'll link in the chat over here the article i found that i think 30 something but 52 percent of republicans support independence in new hampshire already um and a little bit more supported putting on the ballot other than that i, I don't know how else to insert besides saying you're just walking around and talking to people again most people never thought of the idea of independence. Again, it's, it's a novel idea no one really thinks about, but once you present it to them, and then once they hear about it a few times, I do think that the majority would support it. But I, I would love some some more polling, and let's keep doing this poll every year or two. And also the, the legislators. like the, the legislators, if it were super unpopular, like the authoritarian pro-DC statists want us to believe, all the legislators who supported it would have been removed from office. Because again, no one would deny that everyone knows about their vote. Everyone knows from all the attack ads, especially with Yukela and, and a bunch of the others, everyone knows they supported independence. And still, again, besides, I think, two who lost in the primary, also for other reasons, I do believe that that everyone else won their primaries. So like they would they would have lost in the primaries. And guess what? I think everyone who won the primary, I think the pro-independence reps are going to win their general. We're all pretty confident. In fact, I've called a few and asked if we can if they need money to donate or something. They're like, nope, I'm, I'm pretty confident. We have this in the bag. It's a pretty pro-liberty district. My my uh, supporters are telling me they actually love that I voted yes for independence to put it on the ballot because they want to vote. So um, well, like, I want to donate and we have the NHI pack. They've raised a few thousand bucks already. They're donating it to reps, but a bunch of them like say they don't really need money. They're pretty confident. But again, we're, we're pretty optimistic that hopefully all of these, these pro-dependence reps will win in November. Well, yeah. And, uh, and to your point, if it was as unpopular as they say it is, they would just put it on a ballot and uh, shut mm -hmm. us up, mm -hmm. but they don't because they don't want this debate to happen. They don't want people to, to have to uh, dig off into, into, into the issues that are fueling this because it will expose them for what they are. And one more thing I forgot to mention. Yeah, go, go ahead. To answer Clark's question about um, what happened to those reps, someone did, uh, thanks for reminding me, I put the link in the, the chat, I believe, someone did file a, a complaint with the ballot law commission of New Hampshire, the, the state government, to remove all of the pro independence reps, those, those 13 reps, those who sponsored it and voted for it, a total of 16, to remove them from the ballot because of treason. And guess what? The ballot law commission um, unanimously voted to dismiss the complaint because it was ridiculous. Um, and guess who's on that ballot law commission? The secretary of state himself, literally, the guy was sitting right there. I was sitting next to him um, and the assistant attorney general were both there. And they both said the assistant attorney general spoke for a few minutes and he said it totally ridiculous. It's not treason or insurrection or rebellion. All of those things totally involve violence. And this was a 100 percent peaceful movement, a peaceful legislation. It literally said peacefully declare independence peaceably. So it said the word peace in there. Um, so they dismissed that unanimously. Uh, so, so, again, that went nowhere. So, you know, that's an interesting failure. And again, a win for our movement. Well, uh, fantastic, and, and congratulations for that. Well, gentlemen, we're right here at the tail end of this, and so uh, just really quickly uh, from each of you, we'll, we'll start with Marcus. <clears throat> what's what's next for you guys? Uh, and, and tell everyone how they can reach out and connect with you. Go to calexit.info. Uh, That's calexit.info or calexit.podia, P-O-D-I-A. That's our website have all the information there and see how you can get a hold of us. We're going to have a documentary out by Awfully Nice, uh, their production company that does like Hallmark movies. And they're going to do a documentary on us and that should be out on October 18th. We're also going to be releasing our own documentary with original footage, never before seen. It's going to be about two hours long. It's 10 years of Cal Exit. That'll also be coming out. And we're going to try to get those out before midterms so that we have a lot of video material for people to learn about us before that consequential vote in midterms, which yes, I did say, a lot of people were asking that question. I absolutely said, yes, the Republican party is seen as Trump's party. If they win midterms, Californians are gonna freak and secede. I guess you could say they're somewhat content with the Biden administration in comparison. Uh, Trump bad, nothing as bad as Trump. That's the way Californians view it. So yes, I said that. You don't have to agree with the logic, but that's how people out here view it. Okay, uh, Carlos. Well, you can find us in Facebook in uh, is in Spanish is uh, I can say it in English is, is the Confederacy of uh, Arido American States or Confederación de Estados Arido Americanos, 
And uh, in Twitter, you can find us as Proyecto Aridoamerica or Arido American Project. And uh, you can follow us. We have um, um, talks on, on uh, Thursday night. And, uh, but all, I guess, well, all of them are in Spanish, but we invite specialized uh, people from economics uh, or politics. Uh, I mean, regional, regional persons uh, at the regional level. And, uh, and we have long, long conversation, three, four hours uh, conversations in, in Twitter. And uh, yeah, you can follow us. We're building a, a website and we're going to, we're already uh, uh, writing articles about economics, politics, identity, culture uh, in the North or, or of the North. So you can, uh, you can find, us, find us there. Yep. Super. Thank you so much, Carlos. What about you guys, Alu? Tell us what's happening next in New Hampshire. Well, in the next few weeks, actually, I think this weekend, we're going to have one or maybe more summits, just a big meeting of everyone who supports independence, as well as a few dozen legislators. And we're going to get our game plan together. There's a lot of discussion of whether, whether we're going to focus on nullification bills that, you know, will have a way bigger audience and will pass because the GOP really supports it. We passed House Bill 1178, which nullifies some federal gun laws. So nullification is kind of an in-between simple step that we, they can pass, whereas the other bills um, have a very small chance of passing. So we might focus on nullification. We might do another constitutional amendment, put it on the ballot. We might do other bills. We might do a bill to put independence on the ballot. We might do a bill to secede to see where that goes. We might do a bill to form a study commission, which if passed, it just compels the legislature to put together a um, bicameral study commission to just study the issue of independence and start thinking about our, you know, where we're going to have our embassy in DC and all these interesting stuff that'll make it more real. So we have a lot of different approaches. So me and a lot of other great liberty activists, again, we have thousands of independence activists here um, and liberty activists. We're going to get together with a lot of the best state reps and we're going to go over that sometime, I think Friday or Saturday, I'm trying to uh, confirm exactly when it is. Um, and we're going to submit the bills and the filing period is right after the election, November. So by December, we'll know what those bills look like. We might do one bill or five or 10. I don't know. We might do 10 nullification bills to nullify every every type of uh, law and stuff. But I also want to mention FSP.org because the, the Free State Project is for anyone who loves liberty, pretty much anyone who identifies as conservative, libertarian, voluntarist, anarchist, um, independent, doesn't love the government much, pretty much New Hampshire's place to be. It's the freest place in the world. It's the only place really hardcore trending in the right direction towards libertarian plot policy, I believe. And we have thousands of activists who have moved at least a few dozen, four or five dozen elected state house already. So we're doing fantastic. You can find the NH, uh, FNHI on nhindependence.org. Um, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. I think it's at Alu Axelman. You can find me. You can find my books on Twitter. I just got another 20 of these. We just updated this book. It answers a lot of the most common questions on independence. Um, Cause I've gotten a lot of common questions like, isn't it illegal and won't you die and starve and how will interstate commerce and trade work? I answer all the most common questions like 12, 13 questions in this book. It's only a few bucks on Amazon. Um, I also have the blueprint for Liberty and books about Corona fascism and how much I love the Corona fascism stuff on Amazon. So you can find all those, um, you just search on Amazon for my name, Aldo Axelman. I'm on Facebook a lot too, until they ban me. YouTube just killed us by the way, Daniel. I don't know if I told you. Um, Liberty Block, we put up all of our podcasts in video form. Cause I know you guys love seeing my dad's face as well. Um, it was all on YouTube on video form. And a few days ago, they totally deleted us. They said it's like three strikes or whatever, because you guys keep talking about liberty and, and uh, violating community standards, and we have to keep it safe for everyone. So we're gone. So we're really just on Odyssey and Rumble and Facebook until Facebook um, removes us. But Odyssey is the place to be. It's built on the LBROI protocol, and it's from a pro, pro-independence, pro-liberty guy in New Hampshire, lives right here in Manchester. And it's the blockchain version, LBRY, which backs up Odyssey, is totally decentralized and, and unblockable. So they can't censor that. So I think that's all for all of my plugs. Thank you. All right. And so libertyblock.com. Libertyblock.com, right. All right. Well, uh, gentlemen, that is a wrap for us. Um, we uh, obviously we had a ton of questions that we couldn't uh, get to, but uh, everyone out there, if you have questions, feel free to uh, send them in, send them to us or uh, connect with these gentlemen. The links are on their speaker profile on the website at tnm.me slash events. And uh, guys, let me let me just tell you how much um, I uh, appreciate you participating in this panel, in this webinar. Uh, I think it should be proof positive to people out there uh, that the movement for self-determination is alive and well, and that while uh, there may be some policy disagreements uh, among us about the direction we want to take our respective governments or take our respective self-governing independent nation states, uh, there is no disagreement on the belief that we should be able to govern ourselves 
and not uh, be under the thumb of some centralized bureaucracy in a capital far, far away. So uh, with that, uh, my best uh, to every one of you guys. Uh, I am sure this dialogue will continue uh, and we'll be adding a bunch of additional voices to this as well. So thank you uh, all very much and Godspeed in your efforts. Uh, that being said, uh, before we wrap up, I want to remind everyone that tomorrow night uh, will be a webinar over uh, cryptocurrency. If any of you have ever had questions about uh, cryptocurrency, you want to understand the fundamentals of it, uh, it is going to be a major policy driver uh, here in Texas and many other places. And the fact that the federal government is in full freak out mode about it, uh, wanting to deny us the ability to own it or control it while creating their own digital currencies tells you that you probably ought to participate if you have any questions about it. So uh, you can go to our website, uh, tnm.me, go to the events page, uh, and you will find it there. There is a registration link. You will have to register for it very much like you did with this one. So uh, be sure you get that in before it starts tomorrow night. In the meantime, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who participated tonight. And folks, let's go out there and let's go win. Good night, everyone. Thank you so Thank you. much.